Hello, and welcome to Future Side Chat. This is episode number 12 of Future Side Chat. My name is Rob Attrell, and I'm here with co-host Mike Attrell, as well as senior contributor Nick Maddox, for a very interesting and relevant discussion on an important scientific topic. Today we'll be talking genetically modified organisms. Are they dangerous? Are they good for you? And can both those things simultaneously be true? We'll also discuss some of the companies like Monsanto that are working on GMOs, and whether they really have humanity's best interests at all in mind. Hopefully we can get set the record straight on genetic modification in general as well. Thanks for tuning in, and I'm your host, Robert Trell. Okay. That was that was something. How's everybody doing today? Great. <laughs> oh good. Me too. Nick, how are you doing? Oh, we lost Nick immediately. <laughs> or he's just not saying anything for reasons which will become clear in a moment. Oh, no. <laughs> what happened? Oh, Nick? no. Wait, oh. You hear me? <laughs> what? Yeah, we oh, can thank hear God. <laughs> oh, he lost it there for a sec. Once I right. unmuted, it just stopped recording. Oh. <laughs> Let me try again. See if that happens every time. <laughs> For science. While, while we do that, uh, let's introduce the topic today. So today we're talking about GMOs. Are you going to need us uh, some feedback from us, Nick? No, I think, uh, I think I know what's going on now. Is it bad? Is it real bad? Well, the web version is not going to capture the nicest part of my voice. <laughs> That's probably okay though, right? It's getting it's getting compressed anyhow. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Can we live with it? <laughs> we can live with it. I mean, we're not really living to our fullest potential right now, but we can live with it. Okay. For uh, for listeners that are looking for some context, we are doing a test to see if we can record our audio separately from the actual hangout recording. And so far, there have only been two out of three glitches. <laughs> we'll see if the audio holds up. Uh, but, but for now, we will soldier on. And uh, yeah. Sorry. Also, there's uh, there's the issue that our uh, words, uh, the recording, like the actual recording that we're doing, that's not muted when we mute for the hangout. <laughs> Yeah, but so, I can cut it. We're, we're separate. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, sweet. Yeah. We're good then. I thought of that. <laughs> so. <laughs> but now he's going to hear how we bad talk Rob while we're muted. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, if you really want, you can cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's get started. <laughs> and uh, first off, I want to talk a bit. Of, again, I like to define parameters at the start of these, these episodes. So. Let's. I think we should have a broad definition of GMOs, and then also have a specific legal and or scientific definition of GMOs, uh, because I think it'll clear up some, hopefully, some distinctions that have a lot to do with why discussions and and debates about GMOs are so complicated. Uh, <clears throat> so, a genetically modified organism, by the legal sense, is something that it is is a plant or animal that has undergone genetic modification through biotechnological methods, which means that scientists explicitly took genes or DNA from one creature and inserted them, or tried or successfully inserted them into the gene of a different organism. For whatever purpose that is, that, that's how you can broadly define a genetically modified organism. and. There's, there's the vague definition as well uh, that just says, okay, genetically modified organism is any time you modify the, the uh, DNA, the genes of a plant or animal. And so that kind of thing has been happening. We've been genetically modifying humans, have been gen genetically modifying various plants especially, but also animals for as long as tens of thousands of years, as long as agriculture has been a thing. Yeah. And so I think we can come up with countless examples in this show 
about uh, I think that's a good place to start because it'll it'll provide some context for talking about biotechnology biotechnological GMOs. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of examples of especially vegetables and fruit that and and things like wheat where they only appear the way they are today and they only have the nutrients and stuff they have today in them because we have either bred them specifically to have those traits or because we've spliced in traits by crossbreeding plants in order to get what we want. Do you guys have any good examples of of sort of what's what they're called what's usually called artificial selection of yeah. of genetics in in plants? Oh, well like if you've ever eaten corn, <laughs> um, corn is the result of selective breeding by Native Americans. It's hypothesized that uh, you know they they found this one kind of grass because that's where all grains come from. They found this one kind of grass that made you know corn like things and then just selectively bred it for millennia, huh. and now we have corn. Yeah, it's it's always interesting when you look at things like that that you have um, the original corn, the original plant that eventually became corn was this sort of six inch long, really hard, bitter plant that they What's ate. It? Yeah, it was, it, it looks completely unrecognizable. It looks almost like a long green pine cone. Okay, because it's, it's now extinct, yes? Yeah, and so one of the things that always comes up in these discussions is that through Either either genetic selection or agricultural breeding, humans have gotten rid of. They say ninety-seven percent of plant and vegetable varieties in in places where agriculture is a thing, because where there used to be genetic diversity, people have just been breeding specifically for certain traits and not others. And so the same thing is true of. Watermelons, for instance. Watermelons are another thing that used to be sort of this tiny thing that were a little bit sugary, a little bit like there was a bit of the actual flesh of the watermelon, but it was mostly just skin. And they they bred it, so this huge, like giant, <laughs> multiple liters of flesh thing. And they've even bred them to now not have seeds or not have seeds that reproduce and are hard, which I just think is really cool. Mm -hmm. well, it's kind of like bananas, right? Yeah, bananas are, are very similar. Bananas and a lot of citrus, and my favorite apple of all time, the Honeycrisp apple, is not fertile. Yeah. It's a hybrid, so any any apple tree, any Honeycrisp apple tree you see was grown from, like, you know, a splice or something. Yeah. And one of the... Con can I jump in with one of the concerns, like, specifically on that note? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the concerns with GMOs, and this is more a concern with commercial farming in general, is the loss of biodiversity, because like that's what ended up causing the Irish potato famine, was that they took these potatoes and just, you know, if you cut a potato and leave a couple of the little root things on it, a potato can grow from each of those pieces, and so that's how you end up with a huge monoculture. So if a disease comes out that can target that one, you know, that one individual species of potato or plant or whatever, then your entire crop is lost. But so disease can easily wipe out a lot of uh, your commercial crops if you're not ready for it. Although, like, I'm sure you, both of you remember my blog post on Svalbard, the seed repository. Yeah, I actually do. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I do actually. Yeah, one of the, it's a huge seed depository repository. Anyway, they store like a bazillion seeds in Svalbard, and one of the reasons they do that is to preserve biodiversity in the event of like you know some horrific thing happening. So, like there was an example of a wheat crop that was falling victim to disease and they didn't really have any answer to it so they ended up crossbreeding you know the commercial wheat with this old pitiful strain that someone had found one day yeah but it just happened like 
in the notes apparently for that strain was like, this is the single most pitiful strain of wheat I've ever seen. Here are the seeds for it. But uh, by hybridizing the crop with that specific strain, they managed to, you know, defeat that disease and come out on top again. Right. It's, it's worth noting that the, it, this is sort of a pattern that keeps repeating throughout history because when you when you do splice or when you take a, a plant and re, like you would take a potato for instance and replant it that new plant is a clone like literally yeah. the clone because plants reproduce asexually they just grow and so when you if you cut a, a tree and replant the top part it's literally it's not necessarily the same organism but it's it's a clone of that organism so it's going to have the same susceptibility to drought to disease to any kind of any kind of thing that can go wrong and so when that does happen the entire if if there is a disease the entire species is susceptible to it because they're all clones of one another when you when you do this for agriculture yeah do they have different souls though if they're the same they're a clone. Well, that yeah. depends on whether or not plants have souls, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds more like a theological debate. That's true. <laughs> we'll save that for the after show. I, I'd say yes for sure on that, though. They're, they're different. You, like, a set of identical twins still are different people. <laughs> I don't think... Are identical twins clones of each other? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Oh. Yeah. Cool. The, yeah, the, one of the first few splits of the egg, uh, the fertilized egg ends up just splitting completely, and so you get two totally totally identical sets of genes. But again, yeah, the fingerprints won't, wouldn't be exactly the same. Uh, anything that's shaped by environment as well, it wouldn't be exactly the same, but the DNA is. So there's a lot to talk about when it comes to biotechnological GMOs, which is really the controversial thing that's going on uh, if you remember back to the the medicine, was it was it medicine or health? We talked about homeopathy and natural health products. It was health, potentially both. I don't know. It it could have been both, but there's a lot to be said because what we've been talking about before the the modifications that you can do, quote unquote, naturally by breeding corn by breeding super strong, super hardy corn by breeding watermelons or bananas or anything selectively, this is all completely legal and n there's no there's no ethical quandary about it. Whereas when you are going into a gene and specifically splicing in traits you want or crossing two things in a biotech lab hoping for something else to come out that you want, suddenly you have to go through years or even decades of trials and you have to go through, e even though they're trying to specifically craft, they're basically trying to play God with these genes and to get tra specific traits they want. And the problem there comes in when you don't always, when you mess with genes, and we found this out time and again going through this century where we've started to get to know how life works more, uh, you can't just change one gene to make a change. There's lots of stuff going on. I thought that was very interesting, and so it's sort of, I would say that genetic splicing, whether you, when you're crossbreeding plants, is the same as genetically modifying an organism, in that you have no idea what's going on. You, you can't control the effect specifically. Sometimes it works out that you do, but it's not a guarantee at all. Yeah. I think as far as why, why it's beneficial to be taking the approach of, let's smash the DNA, or mix the DNA together and see what happens, it's the same principle of the use of, like, a particle accelerator, where you're like, hey, let's smash this into this and see if anything happens. <laughs> and then if something happens and it's useful and it gives you insight and you can, you know, discover a new particle or a new energy level of some sort of atom or whatever, then you benefit from that. If nothing happens, then it stays in the lab kind of thing. So... In the same way, you can't discover new things in a biological, agricultural sense unless you just kind of mix two things together and see what happens. Like, no one can expect, yeah, like, they don't know what's going to happen because it's science. Like, that's that's the whole point. 
I think. Yeah, that's why I do the right. experiment. Yeah. I think um, I think part of the problem with that process is that, you know, we're just being human beings that live in the world. We're familiar with the process of seeing, you know, seeds come out and plants breeding and things like that. But all of a sudden, something's happening in a laboratory and people don't really understand what's going on. And so it seems all cloaky and daggery. But yeah. I mean, is... I think an important question to ask is what is the philosophical difference between manually putting in some genes and just trying to get two different things to breed? Because in both cases, you don't really know what's going to come out on the other end. You're just trying to see what happens. And actually, as an aside, apparently the first attempts at GMOs were they would just take seeds and bombard them with radiation. like force mutations in the seeds <laughs> and then grow all of them and see what happens, like see if any desirable trait comes out. Right. But I, I also remember my mom talking about that because when she went to high school they talked about doing that, so that's about how old the process is. <laughs> but yeah, she said like, yeah, you'd grow these irradiated seeds and they'd, they'd come out all twisted and weird. <laughs> So, I mean, we've been trying to get desirable traits out of seeds for quite a while now. And frankly, I'm much happier with, with uh, you know, trying to do it in a biotech lab rather than, hey, let's irradiate these seeds and see what comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, other quick note, because it's important. Selective breeding is how we got canola, canola oil. Mm. It's... Uh, we grew a ton of rapeseed in World War II as a mechanical lubricant. And they were like, hey, before we get rid of all this rapeseed, can we like see if anything else can come out of it? Because they had it had a specific toxin that, you know, humans couldn't deal with. But as soon as they selectively bred for the lowest amount of that toxin, it, all of a sudden it was safe for consumption and they were like, hey look, canola oil. Hmm. It's good they changed the name. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rape oil. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a portmanteau of Canada and oil, canola. Is it? I didn't know that. Apparently, it is. It's a it's an NRC project. That makes sense. Yeah, I National actually research really... council of Canada. <laughs> so I think at this point, I want to talk about Monsanto, because. Okay. The, the corporation, Monsanto, has been around for a very, very long time. It's been over 100 years. It's been, all, I think, almost 150 years. And they are, they always seem to find themselves, every, every 10 or 15 years, they find themselves embroiled in ethical or legal or moral or controversies just over and over again. And so we've been talking a bit this week in, in preparation for this about it, it, trying to figure out, is Monsanto bad? Is it is it something that just comes from the nature of being a massive chemical corporation? It seems to me, looking through their history, uh, they've done things with PCBs, which are a type of plastic that have been shown to pollute the environment and have been terrible for... For, sort of for water sources near the factories where they're made. Uh, they were responsible for developing Agent Orange, which was used in the Vietnam War. They were responsible for DDT, which is now banned, uh, which was the pesticide that was super effective, but also killed everything pretty indiscriminately. And what seems to happen, all of these things have now been discontinued, or banned, and then discontinued uh, by Monsanto. And it seems like they get into business to try to make to try to make something that's helpful and good, and then just leave town as soon as it goes bad. And then they move on to something else with all the profit they made. Is that? Well, I don't, I don't know. Like it seems, it seems a lot of Monsanto's problems come from just general dickish behavior, where it's not necessarily warranted. Like the whole. Yeah. Let's patent a genome. It's like, well, that's you know an ethical gray area, and I can see the business reason that they're trying to do it, but you know, yeah. To answer your question, Rob, about 
you know, about if it's just coincidence that they're involved in these things. I think part of it is that it's almost a correlation that's not necessarily causation kind of thing because with any sort of scientific advancement, you come up with something that works for what you need and then as more research is done to it, then you realize the pros and cons of having it, then you re-analyze if it's worth continuing to use it kind of thing. Um, but and I, and I don't think it's necessarily leaving town. Is that well? Oh yeah, it's, that, that's bad. I guess we shouldn't be doing that anymore. I don't think it's. I don't think they go in knowing that it's going to end up being harmful, and they hope to not get found out. I think with anything, even with like Nick, you said about canola oil, like you breed it for the lowest toxicity you can, right? So it's like you do everything to the to the base level where it's like safe, and it's like yeah, you know, there's certain whatever in it, but it's it's still okay to use, and then you do more research into it. It's the same thing with, you know, um, BPA, right? Like, everything was made with BPA in it. Like, everything from China and just plastics had BPA in it. And now it's like, okay, well, there's been studies done and research that BPA is bad, so now we're going to ban it or whatever. And then companies move on from that. But you wouldn't label those companies that were using it as unethical or whatever. It's like, well, it was what was used. So, and you change and you adapt to what's kind of allowed with regards to what science is showing. Right. Yeah. I think I'm more concerned with the regularity and sort of Monsanto always seems to be right in the middle of these controversies. Like they're the first to try new things, but they don't really think about the consequences before they jump in. Says who? It just that's just the way it seems to me. Because they're the um, only ones doing it. If it wasn't them, it'd be someone else. I mean, it's possible they so one of the big things that made Monsanto a lot of money in the middle of this century or last century is a pesticide called Roundup, uh, which is it's basically a chemical called glyphosate that kills all a, a whole lot of weed, like basically any weed that they had at the time in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Well, it, like I even used it as a kid. It yeah. kills all the broadleaf weeds, so you know it usually left grass alone, like the grass would be fine, but it would selectively kill the weeds. Right. And so that was really great, but then they start to take it into a kind of a creepy direction where they produce this very potent pesticide, and then they start breeding pesticide resistance into plants, and then either patenting, copywriting the, the genetic sequence of the plants, like specifically, there there's corn, soybeans, uh, there's a few different crops. I think wheat probably as well that are that are made Roundup ready is what they call it, so that you can apply Roundup and not worry about it affecting your crop yields at all. I believe Mike had something to say on that. Maybe <laughs> you can go first. Um, well, I mean, there's. That's a consequence of commercial farming in the modern era, though. Like, weed... So, weed control is a problem for farmers because you don't want weeds competing for resources with your valuable crop. So, the way that people used to do that or deal with that was, you know, massive human labor, labor or, in some cases, just slavery. Slavery was how you got rid of it. You had your slaves go out into the fields and pull all the weeds. But in today's society, you don't want to have to... Like, human labor is just too expensive, and it's far cheaper to just be able to spray a pesticide on, you know, over the whole field. And it works out really well if your valuable crop is not vulnerable to that pesticide, but the weeds are. Now... I'm not, I'm not sure how they get things Roundup ready, but I'm almost certain that you could do it from just planting a whole bunch of corn and then spraying the pesticide on it, then taking the ones that survive and just breeding from those. You could, I think you could do that, but the whole point of G GMOs in the, in the biotechnical sense is that it's way faster if you do it genetically, if you do it directly in the gene. And so that's what they've done okay. with these Roundup Ready crops. And that's why that's why they think they are... They, so far, they've had, in some court cases, the legal grounds 
to say that we we should we want a patent on this, and they actually end up signing agreements with major farms that say we will not replant, we will plant this crop, and then we will not harvest the seeds and replant. We will like they have a legal obligation to buy new seed from Monsanto every year. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of evidence that says that these new these crops are because you use Roundup and, and pesticides and there are lots of things that you can do to make your uh, crops have better yields if you have to deal with weeds, but it also completely destroys your soil. After a few years, I mean, soil, it's hard enough to keep, to maintain good soil composition, but these these pesticides and herbicides make it so much harder, like it decimates the soil that you're trying to use. How, do, how does it harm the soil? Just all the chemicals, it, like it, from what from the reading that I was doing, it, it kills a, or it kills or at least neutralizes a lot of the bacteria and stuff and oh. chemicals that actually help plants grow. And so Sorry. it's there are plus sides in in that you don't have to deal with crops, but there are this whole other host of problems. And now there are weeds that aren't stopped by Roundup, which is obviously what's <laughs> like all it took is the same thing with antibiotics. All it took was natural selection to catch up to artificial selection, which that's the whole reason for using artificial selection in the first place is that it's faster, but it's not unbeatable. Mm -hmm. There's a whole generation on the plus side of things. There's a whole generation of bacteria and um, and related small microorganisms that are developing enzymes that can break down plastics in the ocean. And that happened, like plastics were invented in the 30s or 40s. And so in less than 100 years, they, these microbes have come up with enzymes that'll break down plastic. And the earth and life is very good at adapting. So it doesn't take long for anything that you're trying to stop to catch up to you, no matter how advanced your science is. Uh, this conversation really want, really makes me want to just stop and go watch all the Planet Earth DVDs again. <laughs> just be like, wow, life is amazing. It, it really is amazing. Um, there's another there's another issue, and this is something that I I didn't know about. Uh, two other things that Monsanto did, two other fields that they were trying to get into. Uh, they had a pharmaceutical company. They owned a pharmaceutical company up until about 2002 that had, again, they had a bunch of legal issues with drugs and with things that they were trying to do. And they ended up selling, it, there, there was a whole, I think it was about a 10 or 12 year process where they went through and systematically in a legal you know, loophole type of way said, okay, we have, there's this old company, Monsanto, that operated until the until the 90s. And Monsanto now, after this whole thing where they, where they sold off a bunch of different assets and transferred things around, transferred staff and transferred, there's now this new company that's also called Monsanto. It's headquartered in the same spot in, I think it's Indiana. But it's, it's a legally distinct company from Monsanto that, that existed before and did all this stuff throughout the early part of the century. Yeah. I just think, I mean, I, I understand from a business perspective why that might be beneficial to, to sort of have this clean slate, but it just makes me wonder if they can just keep doing that. They can do these bad things, get involved in litigation, then they can sell off the parts that are involved in this so that they don't have to deal with it anymore. There was a whole story uh, where they were trying to genetically modify pigs, and then they were trying to, they were literally trying to copyright the genetics of pigs. So if if anyone anywhere in the world tried to raise these pigs as farm animals, they would have to pay a licensing fee to Monsanto. Anywhere in the world, whether or not they got them from Monsanto directly or they'd been breeding them for years. And I, I think it was struck down, and I think almost immediately after it was struck down, they were they were like, okay, we're not we're not going to try this anymore. We're just we're selling that part of the company and moving on. It just strikes me as something whole, like wholly, and maybe maybe the business side is 
separate from the scientific side. Maybe there are scientists that are just trying to do really cool things and they have funding and so they try. But from the business side of things, it seems really sketchy and and sus suspect. Yeah. With the if the Wikipedia article is any source of reliable information, which it may or may not be, um, it sounded like well the the insemination method they were looking at, they're trying to patent the actual method, and then it was ruled that it was it wasn't different enough from just normal insemination methods to be distinct. And then when they sold off that side, one of the caveats was that they had to they wouldn't hold the new company liable for the legal aspects of the of that company. So the new Monsanto would still maintain the legal obligations that the previous company had. So they weren't selling off the legal part. Right. They were still being involved in that. It's just the business side and mm -hmm. that kind of thing they were they were selling off. It it um, seems maybe maybe I'm just biased here, but it sounds like the fact that they had to write that makes me think they tried <laughs> to be like, no, 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 we're not legally <laughs> responsible. And they're like, no, 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 you are. Yeah. I think just the whole the whole concept of genetic modification and when you're involved in developing products that people are so directly using as in consuming, like you're not just like driving a car or on a computer, you're like eating this stuff and it's going into your body and you're exposed to it. I think that's what makes it so much more tricky to kind of stay out of the legal aspects that come with it. Yeah. And there's just so much more scrutiny when when you either come up with something that doesn't work or so yeah, it turns out to be bad. It's like, oh I can't believe it. But when you see like recalls on like little bouncy balls, like no one's like calling out those companies and saying, Why are you developing bad products? I think for me, anyway, like part of the shady, well, the shadiest part of Monsanto's dealings is the whole like, let's patent this living thing or this gene in a living thing. It's like I think, I think it's the European Union that's recently come out and said that you can't patent anything that could naturally occur or, you know, mm -hmm. some wording similar to that. But it's like when you start patenting living things that are capable of reproduction and just being living things on Earth, that's when it starts to get really odd. Mm -hmm. like just a horrendous quandary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so another interesting <clears throat> example of genetic modification that I wanted to talk about is dog breeding. This, again, is something that has changed a lot in the, even the last hundred years. So, such that now having a purebred dog is seen as this really, really... Um, if you travel in, in dog breeding circles, having a purebred dog is this amazing thing to have. And like if you, if you go to a kennel show or, or a dog... I don't know, dog show? Is that what it's called? Uh, <laughs> If you brought a mutt, which is really just a dog that doesn't, that isn't bred specifically to be whatever the dog happens to be, it, you're not going to win any awards because the whole point is to selectively breed these dogs again. And, and again, you get to the point that almost every dog breed that's been around for more than 100 years has these massive genetic failings. Like they, they're basically genetic. Frankenstein's that over over generations are like there's examples with I think it's pit bulls that like they most of them now have hip dysplasia where they like have a hard time walking. <laughs> I've just been alerted that Frankenstein is in fact the doctor. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> I'm yes, you're referring to, to Frankenstein's it. monster, I believe. <laughs> Frankenstein could have also been uh, selectively bred. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you read the if you read the book, no, he wasn't. But <laughs> if but I may jump in on that topic, <laughs> not Frankenstein not... specifically, because I hated well, that book. But I want to say um, that there's a video before before you get too far. There's a video that I'm going to put a link to in the notes for uh, from College Humor where they talk about it's a series called Adam Ruins Everything. Talk about dog breeds, and just go through like a laundry list of 
how selectively breeding dogs, again, is basically like cloning, and you get to the point that their genetic diversity is so small that they develop all kinds of problems because of it. And so the best thing you can do for dogs as a whole is to go and grab a mixed breed or like a, a super mixed breed. It's called a mutt, but the, just a regular dog, and it'll be the healthiest possible dog you can have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well I think... Oh, sorry. Like, uh, sorry. Um, I mean, dog breeds started for a very utilitarian purpose. Like, yeah. prior to 1910, you had all those dog breeds because they were legitimately useful for something. I mean, in most cases, I think, anyway. I don't know what... I don't know what they're called, but you know the ones that are like a squirrel could give them a serious run for their money? I'm not sure what those are used for. Right. Like I know <laughs> a lot of dogs that are lap dogs, like they're literally bred to just sit there and look pretty. Yeah. Sitting. Well, yeah, but I mean, so we have a purebred Shetland sheepdog, right. and like they were selectively bred to live in the Shetlands, so they have like a big thick coat, and they were bred to keep small children and, you know, your flock of sheep away from the cliffs in the Shetlands. So, I mean, even to this day, when you get a Sheltie, and if you have children around, like, that Sheltie will just sit and do laps of the children. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, if they start getting out of line or something, the dog will start barking at them and trying to get them to, you know, do what the dog wants it to do. <laughs> like free babysitting. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Like, or, uh, actually, it was funny. We had another Sheltie when we were younger, and whenever mom or dad came to discipline us, the dog would get between the child and mom or dad and start barking. <laughs> like, no, don't hurt them. <laughs> They're my responsibility. Um, um, but, yeah, like, I think part of the problem has been the focus on aesthetics yeah. since 1910 or so. Like, they've just decided, well, you know, the best-looking ones will have this and this and this and this, and then you start breeding for the sole purpose of looks rather than, you know, an actual functional animal. <laughs> and the, I think it's the American Kennel Club has started to bring out... It's brought out a regulation that says, you know... Um, they will monitor the dog for 24 hours prior to the show, and if at any point the dog displays any difficulty in, you know, being a living animal, particularly difficulty breathing, the animal is disqualified disqualified from competition. And I think that's great because I mean, if you look at the story I'm familiar with is Boston Terrier specifically, like they used to have a much longer snout that they do now. It now. I mean, if you compare the 1910 breed to the 2014 breed, it looks like the 1910 breed was just running full tilt and slammed into a wall, and the nose just got smushed way in there. Yeah. But, like, when they're, when they're puppies now, like, they have to have their palate cauterized. So you, their soft palate has to be burnt so that it scars over so that it won't choke on its own palate. Mm. And I think it's, like... It's once we've gotten to that point that we should seriously reevaluate what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I think one of the big objections is how much people pay for purebred animals when there's a ton at like your local shelter, like rescues, that are just as good companions, and you don't need to pay thousands of dollars for. <laughs> well, for the fact yeah, of having but a purebred. But, I mean, if you really need to keep your children away from the cliffs, you just want to leave that in the hands of a mutt. That's true. <laughs> like sheepdogs and, you know, German shepherds and whatever. If Yeah, you know, if you want, like, a guard dog, then, yeah, get a specific breed. But even then, I don't think it needs to be, like, a purebred. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe it does. Those are exceptions, though. I just want to... If we're going to go, we may as well go all in on this. <laughs> This is an article that I've looked at before. It's talking about, so there, it's examples of dogs 100 years ago to now. And so you get things like Bull Terrier, for instance. Um, I don't know if you guys, you guys can see that well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've seen that before. And in almost all cases, I prefer the 1910 dog. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, 
so there are things like bulldogs or boxers. They end up having this really, really wrinkly skin, mm-hmm. <laughs> especially the poor oh. bulldog. It's just like there's there's so much skin, and it's not necessarily something they meant to do, but uh, like the wiener dog is just way too long now. <laughs> oh man, great story about wiener dogs from the World Wars. I think it was World War One or Two. It was one because they were laying telegraph lines between trenches and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And you know the enemy would shell to try and slice off that. Uh, that transmission line, but since they were all done through tunnels, they would just run a dog through the tunnels with, you know, a cable tethered to its leash. So it would just run over, and you know, they rehook up the line. And I think it was the Allies that were doing that, and the Germans were just like, "How the hell do they keep rebuilding those so quickly?" And <laughs> they're using wiener dogs. The answer was wiener dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's not even so much, like, there are tons of examples of this the dog breeds getting worse as they get bred more and more, but the biggest problem is, and this I'll put a link to this article because it's pretty in-depth, they just talk about all the changes that have happened and all the genetic and systematic illnesses, diseases, problems that they can have now that they just didn't happen before. Like there are all kinds of health problems that these dogs have now that they that weren't a problem when they were just dogs. Mm-hmm. And it's just it it's genetic modification, not even biotechnical, but just genetic well, modification like, taken too far. It's like anything else that we domesticated. We just took it and selectively bred it to our needs, and it just happens that. You know, dogs are particularly useful for doing a whole bunch of things. Yeah. So going going back to GMOs for a second for humans, a big argument that I hear, not only just the GMOs, but vaccines and whatever, you know, additives, um, artificial sweeteners, whatever, that, you know, people these days, they have a lot more disease and just you know, cancer and all this kind of stuff. And that's often correlated with, oh, well, that we didn't have that before. Or, you know, ever since we started using this, you're seeing more sickness and whatever. But I guess my, my take on it has always been we just have better diagnoses and documentation of people getting sick and just more research into that versus actual more occurrences, plus just people living longer too. But I don't know what your guys' take is on that. Well, I think with that specifically, like, that's, I mean, that appears to be false correlation because, I mean, specifically with the rise in cancer rates and stuff like that, I mean, it's a horrible disease, don't get me wrong. I would far rather see people just die of old age in their sleep, but, um, like, with cancer specifically, you have to look at what's actually killing human beings now. Like, if you go back... I think, again, it's like if you go back a hundred years and look at the cause of death in a lot of people, like a lot of those deaths were caused by diseases like polio and measles, rubella, mumps, like things like that that could be potentially lethal, wiped out a lot of our population. And so we started, you know, uh, vaccinating for those things or we started treating people for different things. And so now it's just the overall makeup of what kills us as a species has changed because, I mean, something's got to kill us. Like, Mm -hmm. it it seems perfectly reasonable that a lot of people with uh, cancer might have just died earlier of something else. It's just they've only lived to the point where the cancer can actually, you know, activate. Yeah. Well, that's that's not to say that obviously young people get cancer and die of cancer, but a lot more older people are dying of cancer too because they're living longer so yeah yeah and so like heart and stroke is on the rise as well but I mean we've also lived we also now live in a place where you know we have so much plentiful terrible food for us that it can start influencing us that way and like killing us that way it's yeah. just well we don't have to I mean, kill fields gotta... anymore either we're sitting at desks yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, sedentary lifestyle is also a big factor. So, I mean, 
something's got to kill us, and it's going to be something different. Yeah, yeah. If, as we get rid of causes of death, it doesn't mean we're not going to die. It just means it's going to take longer, and eventually, like, uh, it seems like different diseases have different... They affect you in different phases of your life, and cancer happens to be one that if you live to 80 or 90... <laughs> It's like 50-50, you're going to eventually catch it, get uh, one type of cancer. Mm. Whether or not it actually ends up killing you or, or what is is up for debate, but the, it's just, the cancer is basically the body's instruction set and way of living breaking down in some meaningful way. Well, I mean, if you look at cancer specifically, like, I, this might be me misreading something that I'd heard a long time ago, but... Um, it's my understanding that, you know, cancers might strike later in life because any cancer that is A, lethal, and B, strikes at a younger age will probably prevent you from getting to breeding age or prevent you from breeding successfully. So it's just, like, that's a disease that just wouldn't perpetuate through a species because it would prevent its own spread. Right. Right. If if it was hereditary. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But apparently that's why... Uh, that's mm -hmm. one hypothesis for why a lot of childhood cancers don't tend to be lethal. Hmm. Or as lethal as a lot of older age ones. So we've got some questions here that I want to address. Uh, questions from fans of the show. And I think that the questions that are here and the way they're worded especially, um, a lot of people, a lot of just common people, have heard genetically modified organisms are bad. There are a lot of groups, while I was Googling this for this week, doing research, there are so many groups that are saying GMOs are bad. and listing a number of very, again, we've talked about the concerns, but saying that GMOs are bad is a blanket statement that I think is really unfair. GMOs that have been tested, that haven't been tested can be bad, but there's no, like, you can't say that genetically modifying an organism guarantees that it's going to be bad. There was a statistic I was reading that 90, some like 97% of crops it, like agricultural crops have been genetically modified in some way now. And so we're not all dying, but at the same time, these these uh, these things like corn and soybeans are there's there's a bo growing body of evidence that that it's more to do with our actual diet and the content of the food we eat than, the fact that that food has been genetically modified that's causing problems. Yeah, if you look at it, kind of the nutrition side of things, it kind of goes back to how companies, probably say 20 years ago, latched onto the all natural marketing gimmick and said, oh, it's natural, it's natural, it's natural. Then we had organic. And it's like, oh, this is organic, that's organic. And I think now it's, you know, both, you know, gluten free. No, no GMOs. I think that's kind of the current marketing gimmick. So if you see a box of cereal, say cornflakes, and a box of oh non-GMO cornflakes, you're like oh non-GMO. I'll grab that one. But there's it's just the fact that it says non-GMO, whether or not it really makes a difference, or it's particularly bad to have GMOs. It's just oh it's non-GMO. I'll grab that one. And I think companies will play off that and increase the hype on looking for non-GMO. Because, yeah, you could say, yeah, non-GMO is on the surface better than GMO because it doesn't have any modifications, but whether it makes a real difference or not, that's kind of its own thing. Yeah. <clears throat> I was reading an example. Um, it was some teams in Europe had selectively breeded black tomatoes. And so there was one team that did it through biotech biotechnology methods and another team that did it through just selective breeding and cross breeding. I think they did it with like a berry of some kind, something that had black skin. And 
what they what they so the genetically modified version had I think they said it was two genes replaced hmm. specifically targeted two genes and in the end you got this tomato that was other nutritionally the same but was black hmm. all the way through and then the the other one they were saying they did genetic tests on the the standard splicing one and it there was hundreds of genes that had been replaced hmm. like it was it was genetically modified so much more, and yet it it wasn't better. And the black skin was it was only skin deep. The, the most of the meat of the tomato was red. And so I just think it speaks to when you do genetic modifi- modification right, it can be very beneficial. That they, hmm. they bred things like uh, omega fatty acids, which are very important for development, into wheat. So you can now buy bread that has omega fatty acids in them. Like the same stuff you get from fish oil, uh, which has been purported as being very healthy. You can splice that in. and But it, you never really think, when you hear whole grain bread with this omega-3 DHA, you don't think, oh, that's gen- genetic modification. But mm-hmm. I mean, it, it is. It's just the good side. Mm-hmm. There's nobody, nobody protesting that they've added these beneficial fatty acids into our bread. <laughs> Yes, that's true. <laughs> there, there, there are numerous examples throughout history. I mean, we've talked about a lot of the natural ones, but a lot, again, I mentioned 97%, there are a lot of the, the crops that we eat or that we have in our, the, as ingredients in our supermarket food, a lot of it has at some point been genetically modified, and that doesn't make it bad. It there have been genetic modification experiments that failed and failed regulation and there were health hazards and adverse effects but by no means does genetically modifying food mean that it's bad yeah and i think it's it's necessary to have the type of research go into seeing if those types of things are bad or not because that that's just science working when when something is on the market and it gets taken off that's that's science working that's why you do it yeah. And you're going to have some misses, but you have so many more hits, like you said about the omega fatty acids in bread, that people see, you know, the DDTs and the, you know, whatever that are taken off, and that stands out as, oh, GMOs are bad. But it's like, yeah, 97%, if that number is accurate, then that's a great majority of agricultural products are already being genetically modified. Yeah, it's in some way. It's not to say that there are these franken foods. <laughs> That ninety-seven percent of them are like horribly. When people think modification, they think it's completely different. We're talking about small modifications. Yeah. Um, well, it's a, it's a very scientific process in that, yeah. in scientific experiments, it's all about control of variables. Yeah. So I mean, that's how genetic modification works. You're trying to change one or two genes at a time and see what the difference is. Uh, so the next question here is, I've also heard that companies like Monsanto, for instance, alter seeds so that only they can grow them, and therefore, as we were talking about, reduce genetic diversity in crops and monopolize, monopolize the food chain. And so, again, we've, we've kind of talk, touched on that, uh, and Monsanto have taken steps, but more of the, the steps they've taken more strongly have been legal steps to say, They'll sign agreements with companies and farms saying you have to buy our seeds every year. You can't just replant them. They did experiments with with crops that didn't reproduce, didn't didn't produce any seeds, but those ended up not. I think it was regulation that actually stopped it. So those aren't a thing. They tried it and they got blocked. I think, if anything, that that aspect is more just an unfortunate consequence of our our capitalism and patent licensing system. Like, you know, that's in every single industry. You have patents and licensing and licensing agreements and patent infringements and lawsuits. Like, that's just a part of business now. And it's unfortunate. Yeah, I don't agree that it's it's beneficial to anyone, but... At the same time, yeah, you have to have. Like I was reading that these these companies, especially the the research intensive, and uh, yeah, R and D intensive endeavors, there's a lot of money going into it. So they need to protect that investment and to get the return on the investment and encourage com- like future development. 
you can't just be releasing this technology and just not protecting it and having it just get widespread without having to buy it from the original developer because that that wouldn't be fair. Yeah. As a complete aside, are we all familiar with the song Truck Got Stuck? No. 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 The very last part of the that of the song they start talking about some genetically modified canola seed that was genetically modified for control of the weeds and something something spilled it all over that native prairie soil and agriculture agriculture canada is going to be looking for us <laughs> link it in the notes rob <laughs> I'll, I'll, well you add it and i'll i'll make sure a link goes up um, please do sounds fun though uh, so Oh, yeah. the, next question, the next question, uh, why, is, why is the government not stepping in to protect us from these companies like Monsanto when it's potentially destroying our food chain and nobody appears to gain from it except them? Well, it's a free market. That's why they don't step in. Like, nobody's, force, nobody's forcing you to buy from Monsanto. It's just Monsanto tends like the Roundup Ready seed and stuff like that, it delivers very high yields, which is absolutely what the market is calling for. It's very easy to deal with with the uh, with the pesticide or the herb herbicides that are available, and that's why they buy them. Mm -hmm. Like, frankly, I would like to see more regulation on the side of you know increasing the nutritional value of the crops rather than just yield. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the government's not stepping in because they're doing a very good job, and it's a free market. Yeah, I'll, I'll liken it to a, a technology that I'm more familiar, close to, is within oil and gas drilling. You have these companies that develop technologies to, you know, drill a better well or that kind of thing. So when a company develops a technology that uses a novel method and gets it to a point where other, like, oil and gas companies want to use it then they have a patent on it and no other company is able to develop it until a certain period of time has passed. So this year actually a very big patent just expired so now all the companies are trying to come up with their own um, variations on that technology but the whole point being that like you need to still reward the first company that comes up with it for putting the initial development and research into it. So it, it wouldn't be fair to just say hey we have this new technology Everyone used it for themselves. Like in an ideal world, world yeah, you'd have that, but you need to kind of still have the yeah. The so aspect. one of the things that companies will do, big companies especially, is they will lobby uh, government to do things like make changes or to allow genetically modified organisms to write laws that make it easier to get them through. They will do things like. Uh, you're mentioning patent law. There, there are organizations that lobby governments specifically to change and extend patent protection. Um, in, in terms of copyright and literary works and art, um, they've gotten it up to, it's, it's now something at something like 125 years past the death of the artist or the author or whatever it is in the States. I see someone's been watching his CGP Grey. <laughs> That was an old CGP Grey video. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. really good, as is all of CGP Grey's stuff, but you know. There are companies like Disney, uh, Disney is the biggest one I can think of off the top of my head, where having unique rights to characters and stories is a big part of their business, and so if, any, if anybody can go in and make uh, an Avengers movie, then there's less money in it for them. And so they're fighting with, uh, obviously the stories are older, but they're fighting as big pieces of work are coming up to the point that their copyright is going to end, they're going to lobby to try to extend the copyright protection, and they've been very successful at doing that. Yeah. I know there's been actually, with Sherlock Holmes, yeah. a lot of the, the TV shows that have been coming up with him um, as one of the characters, I know that the um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle family have been pushing to pursue legal action or get royalties or whatever from those works. And I can't remember the exact caveat that they've been using to get around that, but I think it has something to do with that. It's a reinterpretation 
and that because Sherlock Holmes was a character and not a direct work, that they can still kind of use it. I, I don't know the exact details off the top of my head, but there's right. definitely that issue there with, with that. That, that sounds like they're trying to protect it under fair use. I mean, so yeah, I'm not sure. But we're not blatantly really ripping off the story of Sherlock Holmes, like the, the original story. It's just you know, inspired by. Right. Or they've significantly changed it to the point where it does not reduce demand for the original product. Yeah, maybe something like that, yeah. But they're still using the same, like, Sherlock Holmes as a character name in it. So they're still using yeah, that yeah. name. So I I don't know how that all plays into it. Yeah. A whole batch of the stories. I think the the character Sherlock Holmes has been public domain ish for a while, mm-hmm. but a whole batch of stories recently, like within the last year, went into the public domain. Like literally the stories mm-hmm. were written. Mm-hmm. So that's why we've seen a bunch of <laughs> Sherlock Holmes related stuff going on. <laughs> like a bunch. Uh, and so the last question here. Uh, if governments aren't going to take steps to stop it, shouldn't we at least be advised via either labeling or education to try to make informed choices about genetic modified organisms? Uh, I, uh, I'd like to think that in a perfect world, what you would have, you wouldn't need labeling or education that a product had had been genetically modified or part of it had been genetically modified at some point, but you'd want labeling and education saying that this happens, when we allow it, we allow it because we've deemed it healthy, or at least as healthy as the original product was. There are lots of things we still don't know about how food affects our bodies. We just know that we need food for nourishment, but we eat sugar with impunity, and it may be just the worst thing we could possibly do. Mm -hmm. I think... One of the things that's worrisome about going that route is that, like you said, if you start marking everything that's been genetically modified, it sends up red flags and alarms that are most likely unnecessary. In the same way that anti-vax organizations go on the basis of, oh, we're just informing or we want an informed choice or whatever. But once you start giving, you know, an ingredients list of a vaccine, then yeah, it seems scary and it's like, oh, look at all these chemicals and you're putting that into your body and you're putting mercury and formaldehyde and all this kind of stuff. But it's not necessary to be setting off alarms because you can't. You have to put it all into context and how they're all being used. You can't just put a label on there and, and expect that to be enough to make an informed choice. So I think, I, I think education is definitely important and no one is saying to stay ignorant or naive or whatever, but I think you have to be careful when you talk about informing because you want to inform in a sense of, well, there isn't really anything to worry about, not necessarily just full disclosure of absolutely everything that's happened to it, I guess. Right. Yeah, it's an important distinction for sure. And so, like, I I would have no trouble if I got word that there was this new genetically modified thing that had just passed testing, and it was whatever the food ha- product happened to be was a healthy alternative to the previous product, I like, go nuts, try it out. There are, we do that on lots of things all the time. We do that with medication. Like, medication can only be tested so much, and they go through a lot of trials, but the genetically modified food has to go through the same processes. Yep. There are very, very strict rules about the kind of health effects and, and nutritional effects that these foods have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I don't see a problem in labeling GMOs, but I I don't think I don't see a problem with labeling it, but I don't think that people necessarily understand, like the broad market necessarily understands what it means. That, yeah, that's what I mean. Just, yeah. Yeah, they just think it's scary, and so, like, yeah, go ahead and label it, but try and inform the public as best you can what's going on, because, I mean, there there's a lot of misinformation out there. Like, a story I saw pop up on my Facebook feed where they said, hey, they put down this field of genetically modified corn, and then, uh, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of bee colonies next door 
ended up dying, they experienced what's known as colony collapse disorder. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I read that headline and I went, well, you know, like, neonicotinoids, the pesticide, they'll, they'll coat these seeds in neonicotinoids so that pests don't get at them. But when you spread a bunch of seed that are coated with something, you, you get that coating going off and being carried by the wind. And so I thought, it sounds like if you lay down a crop, it's probably a pesticide issue that's killing the bees next door. And lo and behold, the article was like, yeah, GMOs are terrible and we hate GMOs. And some experts have suggested that it's actually the neonicotinoids that are going through the process of review in Canada and, you know, might be banned soon. But GMOs are still bad, and you should be afraid. And it's yeah. like, yep. <clears throat> you don't have to My be afraid. My chemist sense was tingling. Yeah, be aware <laughs> more than anything else. Is there anything else you want to say on GMOs, or should we wrap it up? Um, I, I think I've said my piece. All right. Well, uh, tasty. We'll head to the after show. Sounds good to me. All right. All right, sweet. Glad to hear it. Thank you, everybody who is tuning in right now or listening or enjoying this show. We are very glad to have you here. And, uh, yeah, you can find us on YouTube at Future Chat. Uh, we're also on Twitter at Future Chat, so you can find us on Facebook. Go to futurechat.me uh, to find our website, and you can get all the videos there as well. We really had a good time this week, and we'll see you next week. I didn't mute up. Oh, God. <laughs> as long as you didn't speak up either, it's probably fine. I was going to say that I like that uh, you distinguished those that are listening to the show and those that are enjoying the show, because I feel that's an important <laughs> distinction. <laughs> I don't know that it is. Why would you be listening if you didn't enjoy? I don't know. There's been at least one person that listened to a show. Oh, that's true. Very angrily, Scott apparently Pizzi. all the way through. Yeah. Hopefully he's still listening. Give us a <laughs> I imagine he is. He didn't comment back and say, you guys are still bad. So <laughs> he's happy with the improvements we've made. Must be. I don't know. There are, there are some television personalities, and, like, I think it's, like, Howard Stern or something like that. He realized that half of his listeners just tuned in because they really hated him. <laughs> but they hated him to the point where they wanted to know what he was talking about. Yeah. I, think I mean, I imagine, I imagine it's kind of similar to Don Cherry. Like, I was just going to say, it was like, that's him, like the Don yeah. Cherry effect, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, I guess, tune in because they don't like him. Yeah. I, you're only increasing their ratings, but, yeah. you know, sure. I, well, like, when I, click on, when I click on a video clip of Rob Ford saying something, it's my same reaction. It's like, what is he saying now? <laughs> yeah. I have that issue come up when I'm watching... Well, I'm observing Julia watching TLC. I'm like, what? This doesn't... This it's okay to watch it, Rob. It's, it's okay. Not, no, but, like, you're giving them an audience. You're making them think that you're enjoying this show that you're so obviously not. Like, 90 Day Fiancé is just the worst concept for a show I could ever imagine. <laughs> I... <sighs> uh, at home, like, TLC is constantly on during the daytime, and it's just... I find I listen to the radio a lot more, like CBC Radio 1, yeah. just to be like, I, I can't even deal with this right now. I just, or like, in the evening, I mean, this isn't, it's not bad, but like Grey's Anatomy, that gets played here weekly, and I've really been enjoying reading a magazine during Grey's. <laughs> Because yeah. Kaya has a subscription to McLean's, and as sensationalist as McLean's gets, it's just... <laughs> I like it more than Grey's. Yeah. <laughs> they added... I don't know if you guys know as well on Netflix, they added a bunch of, like, Food Network and Home and Garden TV shows, like, collections of shows. So, like, stuff you'd only have to get on pay cable, like the Food Network type stuff. They've put oh, yeah. 20 shows, like, 20 episodes of that show on Netflix so that if you wanted to watch the show like it wouldn't be like all the see all the episodes but we started trying to see like we'll have the ones where it's like people looking for buying a new house 
on like a limited budget. It's like, oh, I want this and this and this, but I only want to pay like four hundred dollars a month. And then <laughs> so they go around looking at apartments or whatever, and I don't know it's entertaining sometimes to watch those to uh, see what. I still don't. I don't. I don't condone it. <laughs> Rob, can you literally not even? Are you so done with TLC? No, I don't even want to go that far. I just, just stop. <laughs> uh, uh, we got some live feedback. Uh, we changed at least one person's opinion on GMOs a little bit. We at least... Really? Altered. Really? Who's? The person who asked the questions. Oh, it's, it's my, it's my <laughs> that's not as exciting. It's it, well, no this, offense, but this is basically an hour plus version of Ask Rob, because this question uh, to discuss GMOs came up through um, my Asking Rob portal. Okay. Speaking of which, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm, <laughs> I've been sick for the last. Nine days, and so I barely have the energy. You know what I hear, Rob? I hear excuses. I've you said, know what I I've want? Said, An answer to my effing question. That's what I want, not I've, excuses. Again, I've written it. I've written Oh, that's great, Rob. Answer. Have you put it up yet? Because that's it, really all that I care about. What was, it the, was it the why is Nick my best friend question? <laughs> that, that too. No, it was just why is Nick the best, I think. <laughs> no, it's it's... Who is your favorite person, and why is it Nick Maddox? Oh, oh, that's what it was. Yeah, I'm more interested in answering your coffee question, which is what I'm getting to. But like I said, I'm gonna do a coffee. bunch. Of that's great. Things. We're inserting teasers into future chat now. <laughs> is that what you were waiting for? Hey, hey, Nick, how about how about you just write a post on it on your blog, Vodka and Equations? <laughs> well, I can't answer for other people. I mean, I'm a delight, and that's obvious, and it's very clear to me, but how am I to know what other people think? Yeah. Or, I'll like, the rationale of other people. I'll get to it. I will, I promise. It's yeah? Just, I've, said, I've said it's going to take some time, and it, and it is. That's great, Rob. I want to see my slow-motion fireworks. That's you I'm will. Doing. I have the footage. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I don't have too long in this... Uh, We've got like five minutes left at most. Is there anything else we want to talk about in the after show? <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta head out. <laughs> Are you heading out to shoot Ask Rob? <laughs> no, I'm actually, one of the things that I want to do is get a, a real light for this, for my desk. Right now I just have this. Like this? Go 3D. That kind of light? Um, mm -hmm. That light good. and that light. I have two lights. I just have oh, this. Yeah, that's not as ideal. And it lights me from one direction, so I want to be. I want to be lit properly, so I'm trying to do that. Do you, wanna, do, do you guys want to see mine? Yes. It, it's. Hold up. <coughs> uh, breaking things. Ah, oh, my eyes. <laughs> yeah, right. It's pretty great. <laughs> I don't know. Did you see what I was talking about? I couldn't actually see the screen. Just saw white. It was just blaring light. Oh man, I wasn't talking into the mic. The podcast version of that is going to be terrible. <laughs> I mean, I was also picking up the laptop and showing yeah. people the source of light in the apartment. So I'm sure that's fascinating radio. But you know, <laughs> pushing people to watch the video feed. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm actually. Having Audacity running at the same time, it's really interesting to see the signature of my laugh because it's very, very distinct. I think. Oh yeah. Is it consistent? I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure, like, you know, the laughing changes, but like the quality of it changes. But I'm pretty sure by looking at it, you could figure out which is me laughing and which isn't. Hmm. Oh. Speaking of video, when are we gonna see HD Nick? Uh, maybe if I get a different camera. Oh no! Um, our oh, roommates are moving out. Our, yeah, our roommates are moving out, and so when that happens, fingers crossed, we're going with tech savvy at over double the yeah. megabits per second. And fingers crossed. I told I told Maria about. If you wanted to say the word. <laughs> I told I told Maria about the, 
the um, tech savvy service, and she was on board with switching. Yeah. <gasps> It's happening. Mainly because it's twenty five to thirty dollars cheaper than we're paying now, so Yeah. 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 Although if it doesn't work out, please don't blame me. <laughs> no blame Rob. He he please blame recommended me. it originally, so I've been advocating it for years. <laughs> I've wanted it ever since you started advocating it, but it just never worked out for me. Well see, Maria even, asked even when I got to London and they were like Ugh. They were like, oh, yeah, we're going with Bell and then Rogers. And I was like, oh, just go with tech savvy, guys. Come on. See, Maria asked, well, is there, like, a decrease in, like, service quality or whatever? And I was like, well, apparently there's issues with just getting, like, texts over if you need help sometimes. Did, but, did I show you guys the story that they did on me yeah. and the Toronto Star? Yeah. <laughs> but, but I guess the whole point being oh, that we, we don't get texts over to our house ever if often enough to make it worth paying an extra yeah. 20 to 30 bucks a yes. month. I'll put it in the notes because yeah. uh, hilarious. <laughs> it's so long. Wait, when did... It, this after what she was sponsored by Tech Savvy. Yeah. <laughs> Savvy's great. Uh, this was published almost over a year ago. Was it actually on you? Oh yeah, it is. The first two words of the article. Oh, from Robert I don't think I read this one. Wait, did I? I don't remember reading your name in it. It's funny because they go through the entire thing. Uh, they say that there are, uh, where is it? Tech Savvy can't say the name of their, their. Uh, they have like an agreement to not name who their providers are. Right. And then later in the article, they just straight out say Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! You were in this. I did. Didn't, I know it? Why don't I remember reading your name? I remember this article. I don't remember your name in it, though. Yeah, it was always there. I tell you refer to as Atrel. It's like that's you know, crazy. You're not know, Rob or Robert. You're Atrel. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I that's out. that's great. Why didn't you? Uh, I did. Why didn't you tell me this sooner, Rob? I did. I don't recall it happening. Hey, Rob, there's there's definitive documented <laughs> evidence from 2013 that I'm trying to start a media business. Yeah, that's, I know. That's totally going to like be like the definitive like start of your endeavors. <laughs> like, back in 2013, Rob is on record saying he's trying to start a media business. Now it is a worldwide empire called We Don't Know Yet. Dun, dun, dun. A good thing I can bleep that out. Um, <laughs> anything else you want? I got I to head out. Anything else you guys want to say? <laughs> you go? This is the third time I've said that. Eventually, I'm just going to cut it. <laughs> We're just going to have our after-after show without you. Bye, Rob. All right. Okay, see you guys. <laughs>